Ka Na Ika Story by Mary Whitebird Story Overview Grandpa Amos Deerleg thought that young people should undertake Ta Na Ika, a kind of test of survival to prove that they were ready for adulthood. The test included living alone in the woods for five days without food and living on insect. Here is the story. Only the strongest and smartest could survive. My birthday was approaching, and I had awful nightmares about it. I was reaching the age at which all Ka Indians had to participate in Ta Na Ika. Well, perhaps not all Ka's. Some of the younger families on the reservation were beginning to give up the old customs. But my grandfather, Amos Deerleg, was devoted to tradition. He still wore handmade beaded moccasins instead of shoes and kept his iron gray hair in tight braids. He could speak English, but he spoke it only with white men. With his family he used a Sioux dialect. Grandfather was one of the last living Indians who actually fought against the U.S. cavalry. At the time, my grandfather was only 11 years old. Eleven was a magic word among the Kaas. It was the time of Ta Na Ika, the flowering of adulthood. It was the age, my grandfather informed us hundreds of times, when a boy could prove himself to be a warrior, and a girl took the first steps to womanhood. I don't want to be a warrior, my cousin, Roger Deerleg, confided to me. I'm going to become an accountant. None of the other tribes make girls go through the endurance ritual, one I complained to my mother. It won't be as bad as you think, Mary, my mother said, ignoring my protests. Once you've gone through it, you'll certainly never forget it. You'll be proud. I even complained to my teacher, Mrs. Richardson. I thought that, as a white woman, she would take my side. She didn't. All of us have customs of one kind or another, Mrs. Richardson said. And look at it this way, how many girls have the opportunity to compete on equal terms with boys? Don't look down on your heritage. Heritage, indeed. I had no intention of living on a reservation for the rest of my life. But I was impressed with the way the Ka treated women. No other Indian tribe treated women more equally than the Ka. Unlike most of the tribes of the Sioux Nation, the Ka allowed men and women to eat together. And even hundreds of years ago, a Ka woman had the right to refuse to marry the man her father had chosen to be her husband. The wisest women often sat in tribal councils. And most Ka legends were about good women, a kind of superwoman who led Ka warriors into battle after battle from which they always seemed to emerge victorious. Girls as well as boys were required to go through Ta Na Ika. The ceremony varied from tribe to tribe, but since the Indian's life on the plains was one of survival, Ta Na Ika was a test of survival. Endurance is the greatest virtue of the Indian, my grandfather explained. To survive, we must endure. When I was a boy, he went on, Ta Na Ika was harder than it is now. We were painted white with the juice of a sacred herb and were sent naked into the wilderness without even a knife. We couldn't return until the white had worn off. It wouldn't wash off. It took almost 18 days. During that time, we had to stay alive trapping food, eating insects and roots and berries, and watching out for enemies. And we did have enemies the white soldiers and the Omaha Two warriors, who were always trying to capture Ka boys and girls undergoing their endurance test. It was an exciting time. What happened if you couldn't make it? Roger asked. He was born only three days after I was, and we were being trained for Ta Na Ika together. I was happy to know he was frightened too. Many didn't return, grandfather said. Only the strongest and smartest made it. Mothers were not allowed to weep over those who didn't return. If a Ka couldn't survive, he or she wasn't worth weeping over. It was our way. What a lot of hooey, three Roger whispered. I'd give anything to get out of it. I don't think we have any choice, I replied. Roger gave my arm a little squeeze. Well, it's only five days. Five days. Maybe it was better than being painted white and sent out naked for 18 days. But not much better. We were to be sent, barefoot and in bathing suits, into the woods. For five days we'd have to live off the land, keeping warm as best we could, getting food where we could. It was May, but the days were still chilly and the nights were fiercely cold. Grandfather was in charge of the month's training for Ta Na Ika. One day he caught a grasshopper and demonstrated how to pull its legs and wings off in one flick of the fingers and how to swallow it. I felt sick, and Roger turned green. I told Roger teasingly, you'd make a terrible warrior. Roger just made a face. I knew one thing. I wasn't going to swallow a grasshopper no matter how hungry I got. And then I had an idea. Why hadn't I thought of it before? I would have saved nights of bad dreams about eating grasshoppers. I headed straight for my teacher's house. Mrs. Richardson, I said, would you lend me five dollars? Five dollars? She exclaimed. What for? You remember the ceremony? I talked about. Ta na ika. Of course, your parents have written me and asked me to excuse you from school so you can participate in it. Well, I need some things for the ceremony, I replied, in a half-truth. I don't want to ask my parents for the money. It's not a crime to borrow money, Mary. But how can you pay it back? I'll babysit for you. 
That's fair, she said, going to her purse and handing me a crisp, new, $5 bill. I'd never had that much money at once. I'm happy to know the money's going to be put to a good use, Mrs. Richardson said. A few days later, Ta Na Ika began. It started with a long speech from my grandfather about how we had reached the age of decision, how we now had to prove that we could take care of ourselves and survive. All the friends and relatives who had gathered at our house for dinner made jokes about their own Ta Na Ika experience. They all advised us to eat well now, since for the next five days we'd be dining on crickets. Neither Roger nor I was very hungry. I'll probably laugh about this when I'm an accountant, Roger said, trembling. Are you trembling? I asked. What do you think? I'm happy to know boys tremble too, I said. At six the next morning we kissed our parents and went off to the woods. Which side do you want? Roger asked. According to the rules, Roger and I would each have our own territories in separate areas of the woods, and we weren't allowed to communicate with each other. I'll go toward the river, if it's okay with you, I said. Sure, Roger answered. What difference does it make? To me, it made a lot of difference. There was a marina a few miles up the river, and there were some boats there. At least, I hoped so. I figured that I'd rather sleep in a boat than under a pile of leaves. As we came to a fork in the trail, Roger shook my hand. Good luck, Mary. Inko enta, I said. It was the call word for courage. The sun was shining and it was warm, but my bare feet began to hurt immediately. I spied one of the berry bushes grandfather had told us about. You're lucky, he had said. The berries are ripe in the spring, and they are delicious and nourishing. They were orange and fat and I popped one into my mouth. Arg, I spat it out. It was awful and bitter, and even grasshoppers probably tasted better, although I never intended to find out. I sat down to rest my feet. A rabbit hopped out from under the berry bush. He poked the berry with his nose, then ate it. He picked another one and ate that too. He liked them. He looked at me while he twitched his nose. I watched a red-headed woodpecker tapping at an elm tree, and I caught a glimpse of a raccoon scampering through some twigs. All of a sudden I realized I was no longer frightened. Ta Na Ika might be more fun than I'd anticipated. I got up and headed toward the marina. Not one boat, I said to myself dejectedly. But the restaurant on the shore, Ernie's Riverside, was open. I walked in, feeling silly in my bathing suit. The man at the counter was big and tough-looking. He wore a sweatshirt with the words Fort Sheridan on it. He asked me what I wanted. A hamburger and a milkshake, I said, holding the $5 bill in my hand so he'd know I had money. That's a pretty heavy breakfast, he murmured. That's what I always have for breakfast, I lied. 45 cents, he said, bringing me the food. Back then, hamburgers were 25 cents and milkshakes were 20 cents. Delicious, I thought. Better than grasshoppers and grandfather never once mentioned that I couldn't eat hamburgers. While I was eating, I had a terrific idea. Why not sleep in the restaurant? I went to the ladies' room and made sure that the window was unlocked. Then I went back outside and played along the riverbank. I watched the water birds and tried to identify each one. I planned to look for a beaver dam the next day. The restaurant closed at sunset, and I watched the man drive away. Then I climbed in the unlocked window. There was a night light on, so I didn't turn on any lights. But there was a radio on the counter. I turned it on to a music program. It was warm in the restaurant, and I was hungry. I helped myself to a glass of milk and a piece of pie, intending to keep a list of what I'd eaten so I could leave money. I also planned to get up early, sneak out through the window, and head for the woods before the man returned. I turned off the radio, wrapped myself in the man's apron, and in spite of the hardness of the floor, fell asleep. What are you doing here, kid? It was the man's voice. It was morning. I'd overslept. I was scared. Hold it, kid. I just want to know what you're doing here. You lost. You must be from the reservation. Your folks must be worried sick about you. Do they have a phone? Yes, yes, I answered. But don't call them. I was shivering. The man, who told me his name was Ernie made me a cup of hot chocolate while I explained about Ta Na Ika. Most amazing thing I ever heard, he said, when I was through. I've lived next to the reservation all my life and this is the first I've heard of Ta Na whatever you call it. He looked at me, pretty silly thing to do to a kid, he muttered. That was what I'd been thinking for months. But when Ernie said it, I became angry. No, it isn't silly. It's a custom of the Ka. We've been doing this for hundreds of years. My mother and my grandfather and everybody in my family went through this ceremony. It's why the Ka are great warriors. Okay, great warrior, Ernie chuckled, suit yourself. And, if you want to stick around, it's okay with me. Ernie went to the broom closet and tossed me a bundle. That's the lost and found closet, he said. People leave stuff on boats. Maybe you'll find something to keep you warm. The sweater fitted loosely, but it felt good. I felt good, and I'd found a new friend. Most important, I was surviving Ta Na Ika. My grandfather had said the experience would be filled with adventure, and I was having my fill. 
and Grandfather never said we couldn't accept hospitality. I stayed at Ernie's Riverside for the entire period. In the mornings I went into the woods and watched the animals and picked flowers for each of the tables in Ernie's. I had never felt better. I was up early enough to watch the sun rise on the Missouri, and I went to bed after it set. I ate everything I wanted insisting that Ernie take all my money for the food. I'll keep this in trust for you, Mary, Ernie promised, in case you are ever desperate for five dollars. I was sorry when the five days were over. I'd enjoyed every minute with Ernie. He taught me how to make western omelets and how to make chili Ernie style and I told Ernie all about the legends of the Ka. I hadn't realized I knew so much about my people. Tana Ika was over, and as I approached my house, at about 9.30 in the evening, I became nervous all over again. What if Grandfather asked me about the berries and the grasshoppers? And my feet were hardly cut. I hadn't lost a pound and my hair was combed. They'll be so happy to see me, I told myself hopefully, that they won't ask too many questions. I opened the door. My grandfather was in the front room. He was wearing the beaded deerskin shirt which had belonged to his grandfather. Eng Dama, he said. Welcome back. I embraced my parents warmly. I let go only when I saw my cousin Roger sprawled on the couch. His eyes were red and swollen. He'd lost weight. His feet were red and covered with blisters, and he was moaning. I made it, see. I made it. I'm a warrior. A warrior. My grandfather looked at me strangely. I was clean, obviously well-fed, and very healthy. My parents got the message. My uncle and aunt gazed at me. Finally, my grandfather asked, what did you eat to keep you so well? I sucked in my breath and blurted out the truth, hamburgers and milkshakes. Hamburgers. My grandfather growled. Milkshakes. Roger moaned. You didn't say we had to eat grasshoppers, I said quietly, a little embarrassed. Tell us about your ta na ika, my grandfather commanded. I told them everything, from borrowing the five dollars, to Ernie's kindness. That's not what I trained you for, my grandfather said sadly. I stood up. Grandfather, I learned that Tana Ika is important. I didn't think so during training. I was scared stiff of it. I handled it my way. And I learned I had nothing to be afraid of. There's no reason today to eat grasshoppers when you can eat a hamburger. I was shocked at my own boldness. But I liked it. Grandfather, I'll bet you never ate one of those rotten berries yourself. Grandfather laughed. He laughed aloud. My mother and father and aunt and uncle were all amazed. Grandfather never laughed. Never. Those berries they are terrible, Grandfather admitted. I could never swallow them. I found a dead deer on the first day of my Tana Ika shot by a soldier, probably, and that kept my belly full for the entire period of the test. Grandfather stopped laughing. We should send you out again, he said. I looked at Roger. You're pretty smart, Mary, Roger groaned. I'd never have thought of what you did. Roger tried to smile but couldn't. My grandfather called me to him. You should have done what your cousin did, he said. But I think you are more alert to what is happening to our people today than we are. I think you would have passed the test in any time. Somehow, you know how to exist in a world that wasn't made for Indians. I don't think you're going to have any trouble surviving. Grandfather wasn't entirely right. But I'll tell about that another time. 